Please remain seated as you hear the gospel for today. It's from St. Luke, chapter 7, beginning at verse 18. The disciples of John the Baptist told John about everything Jesus was doing. So John called for two of his disciples, and he sent them to the Lord Jesus to ask him, Are you the Messiah we have been expecting, or should we look for somebody else? John's two disciples found Jesus and then asked him, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the Messiah that we've been expecting or should we be looking for somebody else? At that very time, Jesus cured many people of their distresses, diseases, illnesses, and evil spirits, and he restored sight to the many who were blind. Then he told John's disciples, Go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And then tell him, God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. After John's disciples left, Jesus took the time and began talking about John to the crowds. So what kind of man did you, did you go into the wilderness to see? Was he a weak reed swayed by every breath of the wind? Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No, people who wear beautiful clothes and live in luxury are found in palaces. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes. And John is more than a prophet. John is the man to whom the scriptures refer to when they say, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way before you. So I tell you, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. When all the people heard this, even all the tax collectors, they agreed that God's way was right, for they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in religious law rejected God's plan for them, for they had refused John's baptism. The gospel of our Lord, Praise to you, O Christ. It's that verse in St. Luke where it says, and then Jesus told John's disciples, go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard from me. This morning, before I begin, I'd like to ask you to turn to your bulletin, if you have one. It's right here, this blue-colored one. And you see at the bottom of the very front of the bulletin, it's the prayer for this Sunday in Advent. We're asking Jesus to lighten the darkness of our hearts. We want to see who Jesus is. We definitely want to hear him speak to me this morning. That's why you've come, so you don't get uh, the, a wrong impression that this is an opinion's time. And so this morning, for this to take place, for Jesus literally to lighten the darkness of our hearts, I ask you now to do this. Take your right hand and place it right over here. And then, confident that our prayers are heard, silently join me. Gracious Father, for Jesus' sake, lighten my heart so that I may see Jesus. Lighten my ears so that I may hear him and be renewed this morning, be revived this morning in my faith in Jesus, God with us. For I ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you for doing that. I, it's, it's a good exercise. It's a timely reminder that you can pray for yourself. Just a little gesture to know how to do that. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever in your life come to a place when you sense that your faith in Jesus 
is shaken. Have you ever had that experience? You know, some are younger and older, but you come to a place in your life where you're just not sure. You're just not confident that your faith in Jesus, you know, is going to pull you through. I, you know, I'm convinced after 32 years of pastoral work that every Christian, including me, you know, Greg is a pastor. I have gone through times when I'm not sure in my life that Jesus is there to help me. And when you are bold enough, or let's say humble enough to ask yourself that question and to have the honesty to hear the answer, Lord, are you really there for me today? Then this morning I hope that you will hear from John the Baptist his testimony to a time in his life when his faith in Jesus was seriously questioned. You ready for that? And all of God's people said, Amen. On the one hand, we have to realize this morning that John the Baptist was doing everything that God had called him to do. He was living in the wilderness, not in a palace. He was wearing camel's clothes, not designer jeans or t-shirts. And he ate honey and locusts, not meat and potatoes and vegetables. He had simple clothing. And the message that he was called by God to speak to people was quite a dramatic, life-changing message. If you have two jackets, go and give one away. If you are stealing from people, stop it. If you are using force and violence to get a person to do something, stop it. He was bold in preaching what we call a message of repentance. I mean, he was so bold that he actually came to the reigning political leader. Imagine, he went to the head of his government, he looked King Herod in the face, and he said to him, you know that marriage you're involved with? It's immoral. It's not according to God's law. Repent. I mean, it takes a lot of courage to stand up to a person that did ultimately put him in prison and ultimately cut off his head. But you know, in the midst of this, John was not afraid. His faith was not shaken. He wasn't afraid to speak up. But then something happened in his life. When he was put in prison, when he was confined to a space, when he, while in prison, was tortured and physically beat and had time to think and time to ponder and time to reflect, he asked himself the question, is Jesus really the coming one? Is Jesus really God come in the flesh? Is Jesus the Messiah, the one that our faith is to hold on to? Or is there someone else who's coming? Because right now my faith in God is not very strong. My faith in God is weak, and I need to have that strength to endure the next day. I mean, catch him. You know, his confidence and trust. Can you feel his knees beginning to wobble? Maybe, just maybe, he was no longer that bold speaker, but he had tears in his eyes. You know, is God really real? John's faith is being shaken. So instead of throwing in the towel, instead of, you know, looking for someone else, he really has courage to face the question and the answer, and he comes to Jesus, and he asks him, Jesus, are you really 
the one that we're to believe in? Tell me. I need to know. Jesus, are you really the one God has promised to give life and hope for people? I really need to know now because my life is really shaking. <laughs> I love Jesus' reply. I mean, he's so different than how to say modern church people or modern church organizers and administrators. You know, we would have said this to John probably. Well, that's a really good question, John. Why don't we spend some time in committee work and analyze it? And, you know, sort of take it apart. What do you mean by how you feel? Like, what are you feeling, John? You know, and let's do a little study here. And maybe what we should do is strike a committee. Yeah, Doug, you'll be on that committee. And we need a woman. And Karen, you'll be on that committee. And you see what I'm getting? You know? Today, church people are afraid to answer the question directly when asked, what do you do when your faith is being shaken? Jesus looks at the two disciples and he just simply says to this, go tell John what you've seen and what you heard. <laughs> Brief to the point, no bovine scatology, just right on. Go tell John what you see and what you're hearing and let what you see and let what you hear confirm in John what he's really wanting to know. I mean, what is Jesus doing that bears great evidence before the disciples? Jesus says to him point blankly, you know, uh, I am the one who has been sent by God. I am the one that's doing these things, and I'm going to show the world that my kingdom has come. What does he do? He heals the sick. He restores sight to the blind. He makes the lame to walk. He, it says he even raises the dead to life. That's what they saw. The evidence is in the, no, the proof, is that right? The proof is in the eating? The pudding, yeah, I, I get this mixed up, yeah, sorry. You know, you know, is Jesus really God come in the flesh among us? Are you seeing what he did? Are you seeing what he did? Are you seeing God involved in people's lives? Not just the rich and famous, but the lame, the poor, the hungry, the blind. He's even raising dead people back to life. And the one thing that he couldn't say yet, because it hadn't happened, Je Jesus would have also said, and tell John that I will go to the cross, and I will suffer, and I will die, but I will not be laid in the grave. I will be raised from the dead. He couldn't tell that to John at this moment in time, because it hadn't happened. But we know it did. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you believe it? That's what he does. But Jesus also says, tell him what you hear, John. What are you guys hearing me say to people? You know, we call this message what Jesus says. We call it the good news message. I was saying this morning in Bible study, it's so easy for church people to, oh, we just talk about the gospel here at Grace. We just talk about good news. And, and someone's going to stop and ask you, oh, come on, what is it really about? What is the good news? Break it down. Tell me. Hear well the, the good news message that we are called to proclaim here at Grace is this. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. He delights in you with gladness. 
With his love, he will calm all your fears. And he will rejoice. Another word there is he will sing over you with a joyful song. Are you hearing him serenade you this morning? That is good news. I've tried that a couple times with Chris, you know, and it has worked. And sometimes it hasn't worked as well. But I do know that serenading someone is often seen as an act of love. That's what Jesus is saying to people. That's his message. I have a love song for you. And I'm bold to sing it in front of the public to you. That for me is the most profound and personal, life-changing word that I will ever live with. This message that God is with me that God will calm all my fears, no matter what they are. And that God delights in me, even though I know that I'm a, you know, at times a real scoundrel. And that he's singing a song of love for me. That changes my life. That changed John. He was a person at this time who had fear and was shaken. And this message calms all his fears. So let me ask you once again, as I come to the closing of my meditation, of my sermon, be honest. Have you ever had a time in your life when your faith isn't as strong as you'd hoped it to be? When your trust in Jesus feels like as if it's being taken right from underneath you? Have you ever wondered if God is still with you? If God who creates and redeems you ever still loves you with an unfailing and steadfast love? This morning I hope that you've heard from John a message of hope and inspiration and of direction. When the doubts arise, when our feelings make us quiver and our knees buckle, then again, turn to Jesus. See him for who he really is, the one who will come and save. Hear him and his message for what it truly is, a message of hope and love and mercy for me. And once you've asked yourself this question, then this morning I do pray and I do ask you to let the Holy Spirit open again, enlighten again the darkness of our hearts so that we may see and we may hear in Jesus that God is with us, that he has never left us, and with his love, he will calm all our fears and he will sing his song of love over me. And all of God's people said, amen.